By the time the book of Revelation was written, Christians were being hunted down by the Roman government uh, for their faith in Christ. They were being persecuted. They were outcasts from society. They refused to worship the emperor and bow down to his image and bring the animal sacrifices before his altar. They rejected the pantheon of gods and goddesses of the Romans. The Romans believed that such disrespect to their deities might bring disaster on them, so they hated the Christians. These followers of Christ refused to take part in the rituals and the orgies and the drunken festivals that were part of Roman life. Christianity had become an illegal religion. Christians were tortured. They were used for the entertainment of the people. They were torn to pieces by wild animals. They were put to death for their faith. In writing to the believers, John acknowledges the severity of this situation. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, he says, I, John, am your brother. He says, I am your fellow partaker in this tribulation. He says, I understand what you're going through. We're suffering together. We endure these struggles as brothers and sisters in Christ. But these afflictions, he says, are only temporary. We wait for the glory of eternity. We long to be with our Savior. We long to see Him face to face. He says, brothers and sisters, we're in this together. We wait together. He says, verse 9, we wait for the kingdom. We're not citizens of this world. He says, home is in heaven. That's where our home is. We wait for our Savior to come and to take us from this world and to bring us home. He says we wait for him to establish his kingdom here on earth. He will bring justice to this earth. Someday everyone will know and will acknowledge what we know and what we understand, that he is Lord, he is God, and his kingdom is a kingdom that will endure forever. That's our hope, John says. That's our confident expectation. So we stand He says, we stand together. We don't give up. He says in verse 9, we are steadfast. We stand with perseverance, with hupomone in Greek, with endurance, with courage. He says, with courage we endure together. The book of Revelation is a book, a letter to the church under pressure, to a church in difficulty, and in distress. But it's a letter of hope. And it's a letter of encouragement. In all these things, John says, we look to Christ. Look at what He has endured for us, he says. He gave Himself for us so that we could have this relationship with Him. We belong to Him. He says, so we can expect to be treated this way. He says, we can expect to suffer. We can expect to be misunderstood. We can expect to be hated and rejected. We represent Christ. And we represent Christ to a world that is hostile to Him. It's been 60 years since Jesus has ascended back into heaven. 60 years. All the apostles have been killed. Only John remains. The Emperor of Rome, Domitian, has issued a decree that Christians are to be eradicated. They're to be exterminated, eliminated from the empire. So in 95 AD, the Apostle John is arrested. And it says in verse 9 that he was exiled to the island of Patmos. He was sent to this small, rocky island in the Aegean Sea, uh, an island about 10 miles long north to south, 5 to 6 miles wide. Not a very significant place, but the place where the Romans put political prisoners. John is there, it says in verse 9, because of the word of the Lord and because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. For 60 years, John has been faithful in bringing the message of salvation. He was an apostle, a special messenger of God, a messenger 
bringing the word of Christ. For three years, he sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to him teach and preach. He saw him heal the sick, raise the dead. He watched as he suffered and was crucified and he died. He saw him living again, risen from the grave. And he witnessed as he ascended back into heaven. John has been a faithful witness to all that he has seen and heard. But now, he's been removed from the ministry. He's been removed from the fellowship of the church. He doesn't have the opportunity to meet together with his brothers and sisters in Christ. An opportunity that we still have today. John was alone. Life on Patmos for this man who was perhaps in his 90s would have been difficult. He would have been chained, would have been clothed in rags, forced to labor under a Roman whip. He would have received very little food. He would have slept on the ground, perhaps even in a prison cell. John knew firsthand of the struggles and of the hardships and of the persecution of those that he was writing to, he was experiencing them himself. On Patmos, he was cut off from the world, cut off from all contact with his brothers and sisters in Christ, but he wasn't cut off from God. The enemy thought that he had silenced the apostle, that he had removed him from speaking for Christ, but what the enemy thought was a victory... The Lord used to set him apart so that he could speak to him and give him a revelation that sweeps all the way from John's day into eternity. What the enemy meant for evil, God used for good. Sometimes that's what God does in our lives. Sometimes he sets us apart. Sometimes it may appear that we are no longer useful to him. But it may be that he's just set us apart to get our attention. Might be that he has something even greater that he is trying to accomplish in us and through us. It might be that he has even a greater plan and purpose in mind for our lives. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says that his power is perfected in our weakness. Teleo, his plan is accomplished and it is made complete in the frailty, in our frailty, as we look to him for his strength. Like John, we are to be faithful and steadfast in our trials and in our tribulations. We're to continue on. Like John. Verse 10, he says, I was in the Spirit. He says, I was wrapped in the power of the Holy Spirit. What was John doing? He was worshiping. He was praying. He was praising God in his suffering, in his loneliness. He wasn't alone because he was looking up to heaven. It was a Sunday. Verse 10 says, it was the Lord's Day. First day of the week, the day of the resurrection of Christ. The day when the early church chose to meet together to worship, to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper. The day when the church met together to receive the ministry from the Word, to give to the work of the Lord as the Lord had blessed them. But John couldn't make it out to church that day. He was there by himself. But that didn't stop him from worshiping says, as he was worshiping, something happened. Something unexpected. Something overwhelming and overpowering. It says in verse 10, he says, I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, a megas phone in Greek, a mega blast, a deafening shout, he says. It, It was loud, it was clear. It sounded like a trumpet. John said, the voice said to me, verse 11, write in a book, in a biblios, in Greek, on a scroll. A word from where we get our English word Bible. John was given a writing assignment. 
John is told by this voice, write what you see and send it to seven churches. Seven ecclesias in Greek. Seven assemblies of believers. Seven called out ones. That's what the word means. That's what the word church means. Those who have been called out of the world and called to follow Christ. This voice tells John, send this letter to seven specific groups of believers in seven specific cities. And John knew these cities. He knew these believers. Just as the one who told him to write knew these believers. So the letter goes, verse 11 says, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. These cities are all connected by a road. If you look on the map, uh, you can see that there's a road that, that travels almost in a circle. A messenger could deliver this letter. Travel one city to another, just like he was on a postal route. And then John did what most of us would do. No, he didn't run away. He says, verse 12, I turned. He said, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. But the first thing that John observes is not the person who's speaking to him. In verse 12, he says, and having turned, he says, I saw seven golden lampstands. Seven oil-filled lamps that were placed up on stands, oil-filled lamps that were used to light the homes in those times, to give light to the house. What do these lampstands picture? Verse 20 tells us, says the lampstands are the seven churches. These seven lampstands represent seven distinct groups of believers in seven cities in Asia Minor. They all existed at the same time, but each has its own testimony for Christ. Each is separate. Each group is responsible to Christ as each group shines its light for him. But to Christ, despite the problems, each of these groups of believers are precious. He says they're as precious as gold. These lampstands are made of gold. We're precious to Christ. That's what he's saying. Every group of believers, every group who are his true church are precious to him. He purchased us, Acts 20 says, by his blood. Where his bride, Revelation 22, 17 says, we are precious to him. And we are to shine like those lampstands, individually and as a group of believers. Matthew 5 says we are the light of the world. Ephesians 5 says we are to walk as children of light. Philippians 2.15 says we are to prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and a perverse world among whom we shine. As lights in the world. When people see us, when they see this group of believers, they are to see Christ. They are to see the love of Christ. They are to see us shining in our love for Him, for each other. They are to see our love, our commitment to the truth of His Word, and they should see our desire to reach them with the truth of the Gospel that will save their souls. We are to shine. But then John looks past these burning lamps. He looks into the center. The center where these lamps were, and he says in the middle of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man. Title for the Messiah. Title that Jesus used to describe Himself when he was here on earth. It's Christ. He's in the center of these seven golden lampstands. He's in the center of his church. He's alive. Not only is alive, he is with us. He is here. I'll never leave you, he said in Hebrews. I'm with you always, he said in Matthew. We serve a living Savior, but he is a living Savior who is here among us. He's here today, now. He walks among us. That's a reality 
That's a reality for those of us who know Him. He walks among His church. We who name His name claim that as ours. He is here with us. He stands at the center of His church. And John says, he saw Him standing there. Tells us what He was dressed like. Verse 13, He says, He was clothed in a robe, reaching to His feet. He had on a garment that went all the way down to His feet. Exodus 28.4, God instructed the people to make a robe for Aaron, the high priest. It was a sign of his position and of his authority before God and the people. 1 Samuel 28.14, we're told the prophet Samuel was wrapped in a robe. It's a sign of his dignity, of his authority. Kings wore long robes. It's a sign of their royalty, of their majesty. When Isaiah stood before the throne of God, Isaiah 6.1, it says he saw the Lord sitting on his throne, lofty and exalted, and said with the train of his robe, flowing, overflowing and filling the temple. It is a sign of deity. John sees Christ as prophet and priest, and king, he sees the Lord God Almighty standing in the midst of his church. Standing in our midst. God in our midst. He's here with us. Verse 13, John notices something else. He says that he was girded across his breast, across his mastos, his chest. He said, with a golden girdle, a zone, a sash, a belt. Leviticus 16.4, we're told that the high priest not only wore a robe, he wore a linen sash across his chest. Christ stands in the midst of his church today as our great high priest. The book of Hebrews tells us that he is a faithful high priest. He is merciful to us who belong to him. He prays for us. He intercedes on our behalf. He understands and sympathizes with our weaknesses. He's experienced the pain himself. What a comfort to these seven churches who are struggling under the weight of their oppression. They're struggling under persecution. What a comfort to know that the Savior is there with them. He's with them through their suffering. Not only does He understand what they're going through, not only has He experienced it, but He is going through it with them. They don't have to face it alone. They can face it with Him. What a comfort to them. What a comfort to us. We don't have to go through the difficulties alone. We can go through them with Christ at our side. He is in our midst. And then John describes what Christ is wearing. He says in verse 14, he says his head and his hair were white, like wool, like snow. They were lukos in Greek. They were bright white, almost blinding. In their brilliance, they were pure white. Christ is standing there in the blinding light of his purity and his holiness. Isn't that how he deals with us? Isn't that how he deals with our sins? According to his purity and holiness? What does it say in Isaiah 118? It says, though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be like wool. How does he do that? How does he make that change? Revelation 7.14 says that they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And they've made them white. How can you be washed in blood and be made white? We're told by the sacrifice of the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, by His blood, by His sacrifice, by His purity, by His holiness, His sacrifice is sufficient to meet the demands of our God. Demands for payment for our sin. So Christ stands in the center of His church in holiness, in purity. Stands there continually forgiving our sins. Thank God that he stands there and he continually forgives our sins. 
His eyes, John said. Then I noticed his eyes, verse 14. He says his eyes were like a flame. He says they were like a flame of fire. Ophthalmos. His gaze, his sight, he said, was like the burning of a flame of fire. It was intense. It's like he could look right through you. That's what he does. He looks right down into our very souls. He sees the deception in the church. He sees the lies, the impure motives. He sees the lack of commitment, the harsh words. He sees it all. His eyes penetrate right to the core of his church. He sees everything. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature that is hidden from his sight, and all things are open and laid bare to the one with whom we have to do. He sees everything. But he also sees our love for him. He sees our desire to be obedient to him. He sees our love for each other. He sees our, our desire to live lives that are pleasing to Him. He sees our love for the truth of His Word. And He sees our desire to reach the world with that truth. He sees His church. He sees us. Even if no one else sees. Even if no one else cares. Even if no one else believes in what we are doing for Him. He sees. He knows. And He cares. And John said the next thing I noticed were his feet. He said his feet were, they looked like metal. He said they were shining, they were glowing. He said it looked like they had been heated. He said, verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze, polished metal. He said it looked like his feet had been caused to glow in a furnace, like they were burning, like they were on fire. In John's day, a king would sit on his throne Elevated above those who would appear before him. They would come in and they would be literally at his feet. And there he would rule and he would administer his justice. The feet of a king came to picture authority, his authority over the people that he ruled. And there Christ stands at the center of his church, standing in absolute authority. He will deal with his people. He will deal with the sin of his people. First Peter 4.17 It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. He loves us, so he disciplines us. Again, he says he heard the voice. He says, but this time it didn't sound like a blast of a trumpet. He said, not this time. Verse 15, he said, his voice was like the sound of many waters. His voice was a deafening roar. Like a waterfall. In the island of Patmos, John would have heard the sound of waves from the Aegean Sea crashing onto the rocks of the shore. That's what his voice sounded like, John says. It was like the crashing waves. It was a deafening roar. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In these last days, God has spoken to us through His Son. But how many people are really listening to His voice? No matter how loudly He speaks, how many people are listening? He's spoken to us through His Scriptures. But whose voice do we listen to? Do we listen to our own voice? Do we listen to the voice of the enemy? Do we listen to the voice of the people around us? Matthew 17, we're given a warning from heaven. It said, listen to my beloved son. Hear him. John noticed what Christ was holding. He said, verse 16, I noticed in his right hand he had seven stars. Verse 20, Christ tells us what those seven stars represent. It says there, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The Agalos in Greek. Messengers. So are they heavenly messengers? Psalm 104.4 says his angels are like the wind. They are like flames of fire. They carry out his will. They represent him. Or are these seven stars in the right, right, right hand of Christ earthly messengers? Matthew 11.1 1 says John the Baptist was an Agalos. A messenger of God. So... Who are these stars in the right hand of Christ? Do they represent the messengers 
The leadership in these seven churches? Titus 1.9 says that the leadership in the church are to cling to the Word of God. They are to be committed to the teaching of the truth of His Word. They are to be His messengers of the truth. Christ holds them in His right hand. The hand of power. The hand of protection. He exercises authority over those that He has placed in positions of leadership within His church. Leadership in the church is not something to be taken lightly. The leaders are responsible for the faithful testimony of that fellowship. They will give an account for how they have handled that responsibility. But John gives us words of encouragement. He says they don't have to do it alone. He said Christ is holding them in the palm of His hand. And then John directs us to the mouth of Jesus. It says in verse 16, out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. That's an unusual expression. Isaiah 49, 2 gives us a similar picture. It says, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. His word is power. His words have the power of a sword. But the sword we find here in Revelation 1.16 is not the same word that we're familiar with. Ephesians chapter 6.17 where it says the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. That is a makaira in Greek, a dagger, 12 to 18 inch long, uh, used in hand-to-hand combat. The Holy Spirit wields the word of God with precision and with accuracy and he cuts right down to our heart to our soul. That's not the sword that Christ wields here. Revelation 1.16, it says he wields a romphia in Greek, a broad sword, a battle sword, a sword that could be five feet in length. The sword of the Word, the sword of His Word that He uses to defend the church, He uses it against those who attack His church. It's a battle sword. It's a sword of defense. It's a sword of judgment. We are under His care and protection. It's a sword with two sides. He defends us and He judges those who would attempt to destroy His people and His work. What an encouragement to the church. They were facing an enemy that was more powerful than they were. Good thing Christ is there with a battle sword. Good thing He's here with us to defend us. Then, John looks. He looks into the face of Christ. John tells us that when Jesus walked the earth, John 21, 20, that He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the disciple who rested and leaned on Jesus at the Last Supper. They had a close relationship. But now he looks into the face of his Lord. And he sees his face and he says in verse 16, his face was like the sun. It was like the sun shining in his strength. His appearance was almost blinding like the sun at noon. It was intense. John's overwhelmed. He sees Jesus as he really is. He sees Him as God Almighty, the Lord. And John's overwhelmed. Verse 17, he says, I saw Him. And he says, I fell down at His feet as a dead man. John is physically and emotionally affected by this vision of Christ. He didn't fall down in worship. doesn't say that. It says he fell down as a necros in Greek. As a dead body. As a corpse. He fell down in fear. He was terrified. But this was the disciple that Jesus loved. Well, Jesus still loved him. We have to remember who he is. He is God. He is Lord. The fear and the reverence of the Lord, we're told in Proverbs 1 and Proverbs 9, is the beginning of two things. Wisdom and knowledge. When Isaiah had a vision of the Lord, he fell down in fear. Five times Ezekiel had a vision of the Lord. Five times he fell down in fear. 
When we begin to understand who Jesus really is, we fall down in reverence and in awe and in holy fear. That's what's missing from the church today. It is that fear and that reverence and that awe of the Lord God Almighty. Then John tells us that uh, Jesus put his hand on him. He says in verse 17, he laid his right hand on me. And he said, do not be afraid. Too late. He was already afraid. Better translation. Stop being afraid. And then Jesus tells him why John should stop being afraid. He says in verse 17, I am the first and the last. I am God. I forever exist. I have gone before you. I have faced death and I have conquered it. He said, I am the living one, verse 18. He said, I was dead, I became dead. He says, but behold. He said, I am alive forevermore. From ages to ages, for all eternity, I live. Not only do I live, I have life in myself. And by my death and by my resurrection, I give life, eternal life. And I give it without end. It is mine to give, he says. He says in verse 18, I have the keys of death and of Hades. The one who holds the keys unlocks the door. The one who's got the keys has the authority to unlock it. And Jesus tells John, I have the authority and I have the power to do what no one else can do. What appears... To be fatal and to be final is not. He says, I give life. I unlock the prison. I set the captives free. I have the authority over death itself. Do not fear, he tells the church. Don't fear this persecution. Don't fear your death. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. So he tells John in verse 19, write, therefore. He tells John, write down these words. These words are faithful and true. Why? Because they're my words. He says, I am truth itself. He says, write, verse 19, the things you've seen, this vision of me. He says, write the things which are this message to my church. My last written communication to them. And he says, write the things that will take place after these things, the visions of the future. He says, write about the events that will unfold according to the eternal plan of God. Why? Why should he write it down? He says, because the plan and the purpose, the word of God cannot fail. Like David, we pray, thine, O Lord, is the greatness. Thine is the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Thine is the dominion forever and ever. We give thanks to Thee, O Lord God, forever. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.